All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Emily Zajac, and I'm going to be giving you a brief little presentation today on the volcano called Old Doño Langai. So just a little bit of background. It is located in the northern region of Tanzania, Africa. And Tanzania lies in the eastern part of the country, right on the coast. It is bordered by the Indian Ocean. <clears throat> The peak of the mountain is at 9,718 feet above sea level, so it really just does kind of come right up out of the savanna and dominate the landscape, which really lends to its meaning of the mountain of God in the native Maasai language. And the Maasai are a people who have inhabited this region for hundreds of years, so this volcano has really kind of come to be an important cultural symbol to them. And something that had really interested me and made me choose to do this uh, volcano as my project is that it is very unique. It is the only active volcano on the entire planet that produces a natural carbonatite melt. And we'll delve a little bit into the chemistry and mechanisms behind that uh, further on. So here you can see the mountain and noticing how it really does rise up from the plains and these little you know dots that you can see here those are actually wildebeest that are grazing and then something very interesting on the top of the mountain and coming down the sides as you can see <clears throat> is that it is white so it often has the appearance of being capped by snow but in fact it is actually just the rock itself so when that natural carbonatite melt is as hot as it gets you know it's freshly still flowing just coming out of the craters it is a very silvery liquidy metallic look to it but as it drives it forms this stark white very contrasting surface on the top of the mountain and here in the forefront of the picture, we can see a river whose name I do not know. Um, I tried to find it, but could not. But all along the East African Rift Valley, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, there are numerous large lakes um, and rivers. So Oldoño Langai lies pretty much directly between Lake Natron and Lake Empakai. Uh, and apologies if I am butchering any of these names I am doing my best to pronounce everything correctly but that's just a little bit more of the kind of general geomorphology of the region all right so on this slide we just have a diagram that is showing a little bit more of the tectonic side of things so kind of how just a broader view of what is going on in this region so we have the east african rift valley which is being caused by this nubian plate that we have right here pulling away from the somalian plate which is over on this side and right in the middle of it all we get the east african rift valley which you can see from the which is represented by those dashed lines and along that are a number of different volcanoes and mountains represented by those red that we have and let me just get rid of that real quick so i can show you guys that this one right here is old oinio langai so it actually lies pretty close to the equator um which is another reason why I felt the need to point out that that white on top of the mountain is not snow. It is, in fact, the rock. It is entirely too warm for any snow to be forming there. So, just a little bit of the geology about the volcano. It is a stratal volcano. And a little bit more specific with the Rift Valley, it's located in the Gregory Rift Branch of the East African Rift Valley. And this branch formed a little while after the valley began to form. It just kind of broke off and branched from the main complex because the East African Rift Valley actually has several branches that come off of it and it's got a lot of different parts. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the volcano itself is composed mainly of nephilitic nephilinitic and phonolitic tufts and there are also agglomerates and carbonatite extrusions present and with the current activity that is going on right now at the volcano there is more and more carbonatite extrusions that are becoming present on the mountain 
There are also a wide variety of geomorphic features that are present surrounding the volcano as well as on and within the volcano that we will talk about a little bit later on, but some of those are due to the very unique nature of that natural carbonatite melt. So, the very unique magma. It's natural carbonatite in composition, and these eruptions began around 12,000 years before present. Before that, the melt was phonolytic and nephilinic in nature. It has a very low viscosity, so it's really, really runny, very thin, much more so than we usually see in magmas which causes it to move at a higher velocity and it has the lowest temperatures of any melt that we see on the planet and as we've talked about in class like there's the scale of the melt temperatures and as you can see from the range of where the old doinyo langai melt is at from usually about 540 to 590 degrees celsius we can see that it is on the very low range of that scale <clears throat> So it is composed of greater than 50% carbonate minerals, and that is also what kind of lends to why it behaves the way it does. Something that they have found in their recent studies that is really interesting is that the gases that are emitted during eruptions at Old Doño Languay are actually indistinguishable from gases at mid-ocean ridges. So they took the composition of the gases that were released at Old Doño Languay and compared them to the mid-ocean ridges, which showed pretty much no difference. Like when you look at it, the composition, the percentages are pretty much all the same. They line right up. And so obviously they looked into this, they wanted to know why, and they found out that there is a layer within the upper portion of the mantle that is homogenous throughout the planet. So it's just kind of this overarching layer that encompasses the entirety of the globe. And it serves as a reservoir for both mid-ocean ridges as well as continental rifts, which explains the similarities in the gases. And there is also an influx of carbon dioxide that occurs when eruptions happen at Old Doño Langai. And they used kind of that same explanation to talk about where that CO2 is coming from. It's coming from that upper portion of the mantle that is also feeding into these eruptions. And another thing, too, is that the magma is very low in SiO2, so there is pretty much no quartz content in there, and that is something that is really characteristic of carbonatite and natural carbonatite melts. Okay, so here I just have a couple of pictures that are showing the melt, and one thing that I'd like to note is I did mention earlier how it tends to have that, um, you know, that silvery, dark gray color, um, but when the sun goes down when it's nighttime and everything you can actually see more of that typical red glow that we usually see from magmas it's just that the temperature of the melt itself is so low that during the daytime you really can't see that thermal radiation that's coming off of it but it does glow red like a normal magma would when there is less natural light so as we can see in this picture on the left, we have the flow as it moves, and you can see that it is darker than the surrounding magma over here, which has already begun to cool off and form its crust, and it's got flowing over older material that has already completely cooled and solidified into that bright white material. And so over here in this picture on the right, like I mentioned previously, the magma has a very low viscosity. So that means that it, there is a lot of splatter as it erupts. So we see those droplets that are flying quite high up into the air. You know, we've even got some over here, but right there you can see it right in there. And I couldn't find a super great video, but you can even tell from this picture how fast the magma is moving and that it is moving, you know, faster than we would generally see a melt go. And again, it's nice and dark, almost really kind of black, has a very kind of tarry, silvery appearance uh, as it flows. And then it begins to lighten up the further away that you get from the ongoing flow as it cools. 
All right. So some of those geomorphic features that I had mentioned earlier are listed here. <clears throat> We have ornitos, which occur when the hotter melt comes up through the pliable crust that is formed on top of a lava flow that has begun to cool. So basically, when you have the flow and it's moving, it gets cooler the further away from the crater it gets. And so it forms that crust on top, like we discussed in class, and then sometimes the melt will pop up through that. Well, it just bubbles up. And so it continues to kind of just pile up from where it has burst through that crust, and it builds into a conical shape that I'll show you guys on the next slide. And another formation that we get is spatter cones, and these form as lava is erupted from the crater. So at the crater itself, the melt is kind of launched up, and then it comes right back down and lands around the rim of the crater. And this continues as the eruption continues, and it builds up into the shape of a cone that surrounds the crater itself and this is a very common feature as our hornitos that we see on volcanoes around the world but something that is very unique to Oldoño Langai, uh, unique enough that people that have studied it are proposing this new name that I have here in quotations, um, polygenetic spatter cone caves. So these caves form when the spatter cones that I previously just mentioned, when those form and they have completely solidified and there is no longer melt coming up through them, they become eroded thermally due to all the heat that's going on from the volcanic activity and they experience aqueous dissolution. So it basically just kind of breaks it down and it turns it into this cave. And so this is a very unique process that we don't really see at any other volcanoes, hence the um, new proposed name. And within these caves, we get a variety of speleothems, which is just a fancy word for the stalactites and stalagmites. And these are actually pretty big. Um, they can be up to three meters in length, and they're promote, uh, primarily composed of sodium carbonate. So let's get to the next slide I can show you. All right. So here is the inside of one of those spatter cone caves. You can see for scale here, we have um, a person. And you can see how long these are stalactites that are coming down from the ceiling of the cave. And you can see just how long those are. They looks, I can't quite tell, but it looks as if this one is, you know, nearly reaching the floor. So they're rather large. And then over here on the right, we have a variety of hornitos that have occurred around the volcano. And this picture is taken up on the northern rim, so because the northern crater is where most of the activity is occurring today. So as far as eruptions go, there have been no reported fatalities in the history of the volcano, at least in written history. Um, it has been fairly active throughout its existence, but it wasn't until 2006 that the first evacuations occurred due to the volcano. Um, there was evacuations in 2006, 2007, and 2008. And they don't really need to worry about it, but explosive eruptions do occur at this volcano. They are much rarer. And we did have explosive eruptions in 1966, 1983, then there were three in 1993, and there was another possible one that was witnessed by three people in 2006. And when they did go up there after the fact, they did find some evidence um, in the changing of the geomorphology at the main crater that showed that there had been an explosive event, but it's still not super conclusive. And so these explosive eruptions, when they do occur, are Plinian and Vulcanian in nature, meaning that they can last weeks to months. So it has been erupting continuously for over 30 years at this point in an effusive style. So it's really just kind of constantly oozing out that liquid. 
but the activity is centered, like I mentioned, around the northernmost crater. Um, it never makes it far enough down the mountain to actually cause any damage, not that there really is anything there for it to cause damage to, because only about 168 people live within five kilometers of the mountain. There's no real big like residential areas or really dense populations that you need to worry about, so it poses a very small threat to surrounding areas. And here I have the references that I got most of my information from um, and that I used on my paper as well. And these last two just are where I got the pictures that were seen on the earlier slides from. Uh, so thank you guys for listening and let me know if you have any questions. Take care.